We, meaning people in general, are so accustomed to power being abused, be it by the wealthy, the religious, or the governmental, there's a visceral reaction when we're told to view any type of powerful figure as trustworthy. Sure, there have been lots of people who have selflessly used their power for good, but for every one of those, it feels like there are far more people who use their influence to help themselves and hurt others. Skepticism is absolutely understandable. So, when a genre is built on the premise that there are those with great power who use that power responsibly, there is also understandably those that find it unrealistic or unbelievable. Superheroes, as we currently conceive them, were largely created by Jewish American men during World War II, who usually didn't make a lot of money off of their creations, at least until well after the fact. The majority of these superheroes didn't start off as power fantasies in the traditional sense of the term. They were examples of how the creators believed those with privilege should act. No clearer is this the case than with Superman, whom, in his first appearance, is described as the champion of the oppressed. He's not good because he's powerful. It's not like Siegel and Schuster, who faced anti-Semitism and financial hardship, were pushing a pro-establishment message. Far from it. Early Superman certainly fought common criminals and mad scientists, but he also fought organized criminals and corrupt government officials. Over time, the individuals that became his greatest enemies reflected abuse of power. Lex Luthor, Morgan Edge, and Intergang represented the destructive power of the wealthy, Darkseid, General Zod, and Metallo reflect the dangers of the government and the military, and Brainiac and Mr. Mix's Pitalik showcase the dangers of those for whom their power allows them to view those without it as inferior on principle. Though, admittedly, it can vary author to author, the story of Superman at its core has never been one of power is good, but power is neutral and it's how you use your privilege that matters. Still, writers have taken multiple angles to approach the question of, if Superman was evil, what would cause him to be so? And I'm not talking about characters like Bizarro, or Cyborg Superman, or Emperor Superman, who are just separate people either masquerading or claiming themselves to be the real Superman. I mean iterations of Clark Kent or Kal-El that represent not truth and justice, but hate and abuse. I've talked before about how horror mirrors the fears of the author. Well, I feel the same can be said for those that make evil versions of Superman. Power in the wrong hands is undeniably scary. So what is so scary that would make you think one of the kindest, noblest, and overall good individuals in fiction would be the way to vent your grievances about it? Well, perhaps the most influential evil Superman is Ultraman. Not that one. No, not that one either. This one. Created by Gardner Fox and Mike Sikowski, Earth-3 was meant to be an Earth of opposites. England gained its independence from the Empire of the United States, for example. Not only was geography mirrored, moralities and personalities were as well. As such, the last son of Krypton in this universe is the exact opposite of Clark Kent. He sees himself as above everyone else, and uses all of his power to cloak himself in authority and conquest. As all of the world is backwards in this reality, Ultraman and the rest of the crime syndicate seem to reflect a general fear of things not being the way they're supposed to be. There's also a fear shown in the fact that Ultraman is empowered rather than harmed in Kryptonite, which feels familiar when supposed checks and balances meant to keep the powerful from abusing their power fail. Ultraman's been reimagined multiple times since, notably in Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely's JLA Earth 2. Rather than a Kryptonian, this Clark Kent is a human astronaut that is experimented on by aliens, showcasing the horrors of the unknown. And, given Morrison, their version also includes sexual fears, as Ultraman's wife cheats on him and his co-workers mockingly question his sexual orientation. Not to get all Freudian, but Ultraman's own fears seem to be that he isn't the heterosexual dynamo that he thinks he is. Ultraman was revamped yet again in the New 52 as part of Jeff Johns' Forever Evil storyline. Like much of Johns' work, this story is lined with the toxic nostalgia and unnecessary gritty darkness that's found all too often in post-Final Crisis DC. Being evil Superman isn't enough. They've got to add in an abusive Jonathan Kent, a seven-year-old Cal murdering his adoptive parents, suicidal ideation, and genocide. There's so much to go through. Fox's Ultraman inspired a Superman in an episode of Super Friends. Morrison's Ultraman inspired an Ultraman in the film Justice League, A Crisis on Two Earths. John's Ultraman inspired a superior version of Ultraman in the game Lego DC Supervillains. There are a number of evil Supermen that aren't necessarily evil at heart, or necessarily evil with intent, 
but are at odds with justice due to various reasons. Dark Knight Returns Superman is subservient to Ronald Reagan, and Red Sun Superman is subservient to Joseph Stalin. Both may say they're interested in peace, but DKR Supes puts down socialist groups in South American countries at Reagan's request, and Superman in Red Sun uses brainwashing on those opposed to Leninist ideology. The fear that even someone with good intentions can commit great acts of evil in the name of patriotism is very potent. Both of these versions receive cinematic adaptations. But the USA and the USSR aren't the only governments different authors have made the originally somewhat anarchist Superman obey. Earth-X was an alternate universe created by Len Wein and Dick Dillon, in which the Nazis won World War II. This allowed the Justice League and the Justice Society a way to fight Nazis without time traveling. Originally, the majority of Earth-1 and 2's heroes didn't exist here, just a lot of the characters that were introduced under quality comics. However, following the collapse of the multiverse and crisis on Infinite Earths, and the re-establishment in 52, Grant Morrison made a new Earth-10, one in which the Justice League are reimagined as Nazis, complete with swastikas or SS logos branded on their costumes. The Nazi version of Superman is called Overman, and he's basically what you expect. There's some weak, oh, see, he helps out the good guy sometimes garbage, but he's still a Nazi. Morrison referred to their version of Earth-10 as a bit more adult. But honestly, there's nothing adult about this. Taking characters created by Jewish men meant to be symbols of good and equality and turning them into anti-Semites is something I personally wouldn't feel comfortable doing. Some Supermen start out evil due to who raises them, like the Smallville version of Ultraman, who was raised by Lionel Luthor, the legacy version of Kal-El, who was raised by his tyrannical ancestor, or the Darkseid version of Superman, who was raised by, well, Darkseid. All three of these characters, though, are able to turn their lives around. While the concept of evil being something you are trained to do by your parents and by society is disheartening, the angle that you can work to overcome this evil is encouraging. On the other hand, some evil supermen are pretty basic adaptations of monster archetypes with a familiar coat of red, blue, and yellow paint. Bump in the Night is basic evil child horror, Crypto Thrax is giant monster meets body horror, and Last Sun is typical alien cosmic horror. The Dark Multiverse really feels less like an exploration of fear and more like an excuse for writers to come up with twisted, overly grotesque, pointlessly edgy versions of recognizable characters. I mean, the evil Superman from Earth-1 isn't given any motivation at all behind his actions. It's just a slasher story with Superman and then Batman as the slashers without any justification beyond, oh, it's so dark and edgy. And sure, some of the character designs are pretty clever, like some of the members of the Unseen, but for the most part, it's like a sentient Hot Topic decided to make a string of the most uninspired, dark, fic AUs. What if Batman was Joker? What if Batman was Doomsday? What if Batman was Grid? What if Batman was Ares? What if Batman was Siren? What if Batman was Sinestro? Seriously, the majority of Scott Snyder's dark multiverse ideas were copy and pasting bat ears onto other writers' more original villains and calling it a day. And yes, I know, Bump in the Night wasn't dark multiverse, but it might as well have been. Now, The Last Sun is a lot like Vampire Ultraman and Hair Superman, more like henchmen than actual characters. Sure, vampires are horror staples, and Germans are associated with terrorism, but these are basically glorified cameos. That is most certainly not the case with Superboy Prime. Originally created by Elliot Magan and Kurt Swan as a version of Kal-El that grew up in a world more like ours, without heroes, powers, or other aliens, and one in which DC Comics are published and popular. He eventually did manifest powers and was an observer and participant in the Crisis on Infinite Earths, after which he entered the pocket universe with Earth 2's Clark and Lois and Alexander Luthor Jr. from Earth 3. Jeff Johns can't leave any story that was written by somebody else finished, so he made a sequel to the series by Marv Wolfman called Infinite Crisis, in which Luthor Jr. and Superboy Prime try to remake the multiverse in their own image because they don't like how dark the DC universe has become. Superboy Prime can't control his powers, and he ends up murdering, supposedly accidentally, Titans members Panther, Baby Wildebeest, and Bushido, and then later, more intentionally, the then-current Superboy. Eventually, he gives in to his desire to control everything in frustration with his life, and tries to destroy Mogo the Green Lantern planet, thinking it would cause a big bang and reset the universe with himself as the sole survivor. It's science fiction. Anyways, he's defeated and imprisoned, and has made a number of appearances since. 
John said of Prime, he's, quote, really frustrated with what his life has turned into, and unfortunately that frustration is going to be taken out on the world, end quote. And, quote, you can see how his worldview is so narrow and so black and white, and realistically that is not going to work anymore, end quote. Superboy Prime makes sense as an individual whose sense of nostalgia has made him so entitled, so pretentious that violence to bring back their glory days is seen as justifiable. Ironically, Johns himself is toxically nostalgic, using characters that creators don't want him to use, killing off other creators' characters in favor of bringing back his old favorites. And of course we have to mention that recently Ray Fisher said that his career was threatened by Johns when he wasn't enthusiastic enough about the way Whedon treated him and belittled him and his character Cyborg in the film The Justice League. Though certainly Johns is nothing as destructive as Superboy Prime and not violent as far as we know and can hope, there is some reflection of entitlement and intimidation from what others have said of Johns into Superboy Prime. Superboy Prime is an extreme example of toxic nostalgia and unfulfilled entitlement, but in the real world it can look much more like disrespecting your subordinates and threatening people's livelihoods to get what you want. Anyway, there are a handful of minor appearances I could cover. Super Menace and Super Doom, both body split horrors, Sovereign, Fear of the Mystical, then there was the time that Superman was made into a Bill Clinton stand-in, which is gross and I don't really want to touch on that. There's also the versions where he wasn't in charge of his own body, like in Future's End and Deceased, both of which are again body horrors, but don't really match up with what we were talking about in terms of a Superman being evil. But the last type of evil Superman I want to examine is the post-traumatic dictator type. Sounds specific, but there have been two. The original, and superior, version was by Stan Berkowitz for the Justice League TV show episode A Better World. This alternate universe is not a mirror, it's a split timeline, one where President Lex Luthor executed the Flash and threatened nuclear war upon the world. As the only people that could stop it, the Justice League stormed the White House, and Superman, out of patience and out of time, kills Luthor. Over the next two years, the Justice League, now known as the Justice Lords, have accumulated immense power and instituted global authoritarianism. From the Justice Lords' perspective, they're just being temporary substitutes for the world's governments, which have failed. But from an objective outsider's point of view, they've obviously become tyrants. The fear here is that a path of difficult decisions and the wrongdoings of others can ultimately lead you to make decisions that are morally questionable, and eventually, the more compromises you make, the more you begin to see as acceptable. Your friends enable your bad behavior, and you become possessive of people you think you're helping. A Better World isn't the Killing Joke's One Bad Day storyline. Clark and his friends aren't pushed over the edge by one solitary act. It's a culmination of events over years leading to the tyranny. A story that steals, or perhaps borrows would be a nicer word, a lot of story notes from A Better World is the one told in Injustice. Injustice Gods Among Us, like A Better World, involves a more familiar Justice League traveling to an alternate universe where a tyrannical Superman has ruled over Earth for years, and our more familiar heroes need to stop him. The differences are where the story really suffers. To begin, it is very much portrayed as a killing joke, one bad day type of situation that drives Superman to authoritarianism. Joker mind controls Clark into killing his wife and unborn daughter, ultimately triggering a nuclear bomb, killing the vast majority of Metropolis. Following this, Clark kills the Joker. Now, look, personally, and I say this as someone that is opposed to the death penalty and very much supports rehabilitation over time, but the Joker just killed 11 million people. Superman killing him is treated by Batman as this irredeemable, soul-damning act. Superman's refusal to forgive Harley Quinn for her act of genocide which, for some reason, Batman forgives her for that, but not Superman for killing the Joker, that's treated as irrational. And perhaps, most confusingly, nobody tries to talk him through his grief. Not really. In A Better World, people who went through the same things justify each other's actions, and the government showing itself to be incapable of holding itself in check leads to no more accountable but separate entities to take it over, they are absolutely not justified, but along the way they can rationalize things to themselves. In Injustice, there's a seemingly arbitrary division between good heroes and bad heroes, and the bad heroes go from killing a genocidal man to 
imposing their will on any world government and punishing those that disagree with their will. Plus, there's that age-old using a woman's death to make a male character suddenly change everything about himself. And I'm not even getting into the weird optics angle when it comes to who is on which side of the fight between Superman's regime and Batman's insurgency. The regime is comprised entirely of immigrants, save Cyborg, who is black and disabled. In the insurgency, the only members that aren't white U.S. Americans are the two plucky comic relief sidekicks and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed exception to the rule that all other immigrants in the narrative are dangerous and untrustworthy, and irredeemable. Plus, in the tie-in comic, they have Flash equates Superman's idea to get rid of guns to a movement to execute all people in the world who don't recycle. Because, you know, that's what happens in all of the countries that have harsher gun laws than the U.S. does, apparently. Freedom. And increased ease for murderers to kill multiple people. Those are the main different types of evil supermen. Just like with horror in general. They range from just plain fun, to fear of the other and fear of people who are different from ourselves, to healthy reflections on the things that are bad about ourselves even if maybe the author doesn't recognize that that's what they are reflecting. The original story of Superman is not only one about a man with privilege using that privilege to help those without it, but also the story of an immigrant finding a place in a community despite there being those that don't want to welcome him there. No matter who you are, there are good messages to be found in this character. Evil versions of him explore the exact opposite messages, but frame them in a negative context even if they do so tastelessly sometimes. But the benefits of an alternate reality story, aside from being fun, is that they allow characters, and thus readers by proxy, to reflect upon themselves. And that's something that I believe fiction can do very well. 